So I'm going to introduce our superb keynote speaker today. Um, we're very lucky to have Patrice Jones with us, who is the co-founder of Vine Sanctuary. That's an LGBTQ-run farmed animal sanctuary that works from within an eco-feminist understanding of the intersection of oppressions. Her activist work dates back to the 1970s and includes anti-racist education, tenant organizing, and direct action against AIDS, as well as work within the feminist, peace, and LGBTQ liberation movements. She's taught college and university courses on the praxis of social change, and her contributions to movement thinking appear in numerous anthologies, as well as her book, Aftershock, which is superb, and you should all check it out. Hi. Hi. So I'm shy, um, and um, every once in a while it really hits me. Uh, and they had me all mic'd up so I could wander around like I like to do, and then they told me it doesn't work. <laughs> And I can't think about that big screen up there. Um, so I think I'll start here, then I'll start walking around and really hope not to trip over the mic. Um, I am here. Um, I want to just a big thanks. Can everybody just applaud the organizers? Uh, uh, since we're running late, I won't spend the time I was going to spend telling you how fabulous it is, because you'll see by being here how fabulous it is. Um, I was so happy uh, to learn uh, that we would be uh, starting with a, uh, a recognition of, 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 of the land, uh, because we need to be grounded um, and thinking about the land that we stand on, which we're not standing on right now because of all these things that are built on it, um, that can help to even like try and feel that land under there. And me, uh, coming from Vine Sanctuary, I always uh, uh, the pay attention to who's saying goodbye to me when I, when I go off to an event like this. And so I just want to let you know that the, the folks who came to say goodbye to me before I drove here uh, were uh, uh, Princess, we didn't come up with that name, Princess, uh, who is a former dairy cow, uh, Buddy, uh, who uh, only barely saved from being made into beef, and uh, Sharky, a former fighting rooster. And... Um, It turns out none of them would have been in the precarious situations they were in were it not for the conquest. So thinking about the land is really important. Thinking about the land tells us not just where we are, but how we got there and, um, and, 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 and starts to suggest not, not, just, not just where we need to go, but how we might get there together. So, Let's think about Columbus, who um, didn't just bring what would become racism, but also sexism and homophobia. The same conquistadors who were sexually violating Native women, and if you don't know that history, read Conquest by Andrea Smith, they were also levying the death penalty on homosexuals and gender non-normative people like me. They not only brought smallpox, they brought gold fever, thereby paving the way for capitalism and the commodification of everything. And they brought cows, lots and lots and lots of cows and pigs and chickens. Ecologist Alfred Crosby says that if, 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 if space aliens had been watching the planet during the era of the conquest of the Americas, they would think, and this is a quote from him, that the object of the game being played was to remove the native people and replace them with farm animals. And of course, all of those 
captive cows. Well, of course, this ushers in, and I'll talk about this later, a whole new way of thinking about our relationship to animals. Um, but, but, but all of those captive cows are now a leading source of climate change. So this is what we mean when we use the word intersectionality. Not that it's all connected in some sort of vague way but that it's all inextricably linked. And that you can't really understand any aspect of it unless you're willing to think about the connections and see how it all fits together. And that, and that, and that, and that we, can't, we can't hope to solve any, any one problem without reference to the others without kicking over the whole system. So, the idea of intersectionality, uh, the word, the first person to use the word was Kimberly Crenshaw, she was a black feminist legal scholar, is still a black feminist legal scholar, and you can actually, if you just Google Kimberly Crenshaw intersectionality, you can find uh, her original article uh, uh, free online in a PDF uh, where she first used the term. She first used the term uh, with reference uh, to race and gender. Uh, as a legal scholar in particular, she had seen how the forms of job discrimination and other discrimination experienced by women of color, uh, oftentimes the people had no recourse. They didn't have any recourse because they couldn't call it sex discrimination because white women weren't experiencing it. And they couldn't call it race discrimination because black men weren't experiencing it. And it was actually the discrimination they were experiencing was a function of racism and sexism in interaction with one another. This is a key, important, one, intersectionality itself is a essential conceptual tool. That's why I'm taking time to tell you about it. Um, I, I stopped myself because I was getting ahead of myself. I was getting ready to explain some of the key aspects of intersectionality to you, but what I need to do first is make sure you understand how essential this conceptual tool is. So, so, so Kimberly Crenshaw first used the word, uh, feminists of color, not just black feminists, uh, uh, really started working with it, really started, and, and of course some white feminists as well, uh, really started looking at the intersections between, first it was race, gender, and class. Uh, 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 but at the same time, some feminists were looking at the intersections between homophobia and sexism. And we're starting to uh, see some important things about that. More recently, uh, then we started to think about the intersections uh, 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 with uh, people, uh, disability, uh, uh, ethnicity, uh, list, all of them. More recently, finally, we uh, uh, have started to think about environmental racism and environmental justice and how all of these intersecting forms of oppression among homo sapiens both lead to and are worsened by the despoliation of the environment. And now we're at the stage where finally some people <clears throat> Not a whole lot of us. That's why it's so important for y'all to start thinking about it, too, if you haven't already. Um, <clears throat> we can't pretend to have yet already thought it through. Uh, uh, are thinking through exactly how it is that speciesism intersects. And if we think about it, we, we start to see that speciesism is, in fact, foundational uh, uh, to virtually every uh, form of oppression that people visit on each other uh, and, and, and I'm very much bound up with our despoliation of the earth. So, it's an essential conceptual tool. You, if you're an animal advocate and this is new to you, need to get current quick because, wow, we really need to be thinking about this and we really uh, need to understand it for a couple reasons. One, because it's true. 
Um, and, 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 and because it's true, what that means is that we will not be able to accurately diagnose the problem that we are trying to solve unless we understand. You see what I'm saying? Uh, 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 so, so speciesism is inextricably bound up with these other so-called other forms of oppression. Every single thing that is done to an animal or an animal's habitat is done. Anything that's done by people is done by people. People in particular social contexts. Social contexts that include racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and etc. People who are living in economic circumstances which are shaped by those social forces. People living in physical places that have been and continue to be shaped by these forces. And so if we think we can liberate animals without reference to these things, well, you know, that's just not sensible thinking. So that's the first reason, because it's true and because we can't possibly understand the problem we're going to solve unless we understand it. And the other reason is, 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 is equally easy to understand. Um, oh, and I just caught myself moving, and I'm so glad I can't see the screen. Um, and the other thing is that to liberate animals, think of all the ways that animals are oppressed by people. Think of all of the local and regional economies that are founded upon the exploitation of animals. Think about the ways that products of animals are incorporated into the global economy. Liberating animals, not to mention, oh my gosh, restoring their habitats to them? This will require a fundamental restructuring of local economies, of the world economy, of human psychology. Ain't no way the tiny little group of animal liberation activists, and not particularly diverse group of animal liberation activists, can possibly affect that kind of worldwide change. The absolutely only way we're going to do it is if we are in sincere solidarity with social and environmental justice movements and in the course of that lead people in social and environmental justice movements to understand that speciesism is their problem too. To make the liberation of animals, to understand that the liberation of animals must be part of their own agenda because speciesism is in, uh, some, the person who was, she called herself, she said she was rambling. Sorry, don't know your name. Sarah, she was saying something about colonialism being in everything. Yes, everywhere in every. Well, speciesism is in everything. And 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 if then the environmental justice movement comes to understand that, then ending speciesism becomes part of that movement too. Uh, we need a unified worldwide movement. Yeah. Okay, so, and we can't do that without the basic ABC conceptual tool of intersectionality. So, what do you need to understand about intersectionality? It's not just, uh, like, oh, oh, uh, uh, addition. Racism plus sexism equals worse. Um, uh, 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 the term that they used to use for that was double jeopardy. Uh, but, turns out it's not that easy. You can't, untangle, um, you can't untangle the different forms of oppression from each other. So like, so like, so like if you add up like four plus five, huh, and you put them together, you can still like pull the five and the four back away from each other, right? And you can see, oh, well, this was the four and this was the five, right? What's four times five? Somebody. Twenty, right, yeah, my math is really bad. Um, so, 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 and, and if you've got that twenty, Imagine that's 20. Imagine 4 times 5, and now we've got 20. Okay, which ones of those is the 4 and which is the 5? You can't. 
because the 20 is a function of 4 and 5 in interaction with one another. That's how different forms of oppression interact with each other. Uh, uh, they, they intermingle like catalysts with each other, and the, the new thing that comes up is not something that you can then pull the different pieces apart from. Does that make sense? So that's a, that's a key idea. Uh, another key idea is that the different forms of oppression support one another. They prop one another up. We can see this most clearly with um, homophobia and, 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 and sexism. Do you need to be gay to be gay bashed? No? Do you actually have to be trans to be subjected to transphobic bullying? What do you have to do? Exist in what way? Well, I can't hear you. But I think the answer to the question is violate gender norms. I think that all that you have to do to be uh, called queer in high school, whether or not you actually want to have relations with members of your same sex, is, is violate gender norms. If you're, if you're male, don't like sports and do like show tunes. Um, if you're... Uh, uh, female then uh, do like sports and don't want a boyfriend because uh, you're more interested in math right now and uh, you could be called any one of the words that I'm not going to trigger people by shouting out, okay? Uh, uh, if you, and, 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 and you could be gay bashed to death, you could be trans bashed to death just for walking down the street wearing the wrong thing. It doesn't matter who, who you actually want to sleep with. It doesn't matter who you, th what your self-identity is in that matter. All that matters is that you're walking down the street violating gender norms. Yes? Okay. And so then we can see that the function of homophobia and the function of transphobia is to prop up that gender system, that man-on-top gender system. And they're not, and so, and so, and so we can see that, um, and it took feminists a long time to understand, hey, you know what, you're not going to solve sexism unless you're also solving homophobia. And it took a long time. Uh, and actually, a number of people in the LGBTQ movement still don't quite understand. And many feminists don't understand. A lot of people still don't understand. You're not going to solve one without solving the other. We just can't. We'll never make it. Okay. So. Ah, another huge uh, thing is that, um, hey, where's, um, where's Mark Hawthorne? Mark has a book called Striking at the Roots, uh, where he's talking about different forms of, of, of animal activism, striking at the roots, which is a nice metaphor, right? And also, by the way, a good book. Um, has that for a shout out. <laughs> um, 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 but the thing is, the roots are all entangled. The roots are all entangled. And so another nice metaphor is kicking out the joints. The idea is if you want to bust up a piece of furniture, I wish I had one, a wooden chair here, right? If you want to bust up a piece of furniture, like let's imagine this was a wooden table and I wanted to bust it up, right? I mean, I could just go here, right? There. But that would like be so hard. The thing to do would be to, you know, get at the joints, right? Okay, so that's another key thing with intersectionality. If you look, find those intersections between two different kinds of oppression and target them, you're going to, it's going to be more undermining of the system. And also, oh, it's like this groovy activist bonus because you're doing two things at once, right? Um, uh, 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 and so, and so one, if, if you're, if your little project, whatever your project is, if you're targeting two different forms of oppression at once, if your project works, then hey, all by itself, that was good. But also because you were targeting the joints, you're being more undermining of the whole system. Okay. Those are the key things about intersectionality. You need to know, obviously, uh, books and books and books have been written on it. So I can't possibly give you a complete education. Educate yourself, which brings me to the next point. Mm. Okay. You would like to think intersectionally. You would like to be able to understand what are the relationships between, say, racism and speciesism. 
Huh. Well, how are you going to do that unless you know something about both of those things? So you may need to educate yourself. Uh, animal liberation activists are extraordinary at um, vacuuming up, or do y'all say hoovering here? Uh, taking in lots and lots of information about specific kinds of animal exploitation. Um, uh, uh, that same kind of self-educating has to happen for many animal activists about social justice issues. And similarly, social justice people who have uh, the very few who have begun to be awake to the connections to species is may need to do some education there. You can't expect yourself to like see things if you don't know things. Uh, 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 here's a little tip from a former teacher. Uh, 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 if you want to learn, uh, one way to learn is to read um, uh, first person accounts and histories of the movements against different forms of oppression because when you read an account about a movement against a particular like let's say you were to read an anthology by disability rights activists then you're not just going to learn about uh, 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 discrimination against people with disabilities uh, you're also going to get an education in activist history and maybe learn some new activist tactics along the way. So it's another two for one, right? So do your educating of yourself about different uh, forms of oppression by learning about different movements against oppression. Oh, documentaries are great too for those who, who, who don't uh, uh, care to read as much. Okay, the other thing that you have to do to be thinking about intersectionality is to, to, to know that if you grew up in the US or Canada and you attended the school systems here, uh, you've been taught to think in exactly the opposite direction of seeing connections. Um, uh, you've been schooled to understand things by dividing and conquering, uh, division and classify. Um, uh, and it works great for algebra, right? I mean, uh, uh, if you want to solve an algebraic equation, then what you really do need to do is get that one variable all by itself on one side. But mm, it's exactly the opposite of what you need to do uh, to think intersection in intersectionally. To think intersectionally, and also, by the way, to think ecologically, uh, is to see connections. And you may need to be pretty mindful and conscious of the need to teach yourself to see connections. Um, you can also do little exercises uh, to get better at intersectional thinking. Back when I worked at the Baker Mandela Center for Anti-Racist Education in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I went on a multi-year extravaganza of self-education uh, around intersectionality where I would just periodically give myself little exercises that I would make myself do. Um, and so I would say, okay, mm, disability rights and racism, what are the connections? And then like make myself write about it, not just in your head writing, because you get, can be slippery if you just stay in your head. You think you got something thought through, but you didn't. Um, so there's different things you can do. One, you can just pick two forms of oppression, challenge yourself to come up with all the different ways that they intersect. Another thing that you can do uh, is to pick a tactic of oppression, like stereotyping or incarceration, um, and then challenge yourself to see how many different forms of oppression use that tactic and how. Um, you can think about an impact of one form of oppression, such as the callousness implicit in eating meat, the just not thinking about where it came from, and say, hmm, people carry that into the rest of their lives. Does it make it harder or easier for them to buy slave picked chocolate? What other ways, uh, are there other forms of oppression that this one form of oppression is actually supporting by making people more callous? I think there's lots, actually. Um, what else? You can pick a, pick a particular problem like zoos or dairy, uh, so-called, and, and, and challenge yourself to find how, how, how many different forms of oppression are intersecting there. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, well, not finally, but it's the last one I'm going to say. 
Um, uh, you could pick a, 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 an event in history uh, or, or just any old event and say, okay, well, how many, how many, how many intersecting forms of oppression uh, can I find? And by looking at this event, what can I learn about how they interact? All of those are, I wouldn't call them fun exercises, uh, but they can be really, really useful. Okay, so let's do that. Um, if, if we were to do that, if we were to do that, we already started to do that now with the conquest, right, with what I've already just said. Um, and I can't do it as extensively as I would like. Again, books and books. But if we do look closely at the conquest, then we, we learn a lot. And we can see, we can see actually in the conquest is, is a really good example of another really important conceptual tool that I want to introduce you to. Um, so the, 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 first the conquistadors, and then later the Brits and the French. Uh, they brought, they brought not just their bodies, well, they brought cows, we said that, and they brought their own bodies, and in their own bodies were their brains, right? And, and, and in their brains were um, some ideas. And, uh, 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 and those ideas were in certain patterns. I'm going to get up and move around because I'm seeing restlessness. So I'll move around, and that'll make you feel less restless. How does that work? I don't know. Okay. Oh, I'm not going to be able to. Yes, I am. Okay, so, so, <laughs> oh my God, okay. It would have been better if I fell completely right, because then it would have been a real pratfall. Okay, so, 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 in their brains, uh, there were ideas, and their ideas, um, eco-feminist scholars would say, were patterned according to uh, a logic of domination. Like they had a way of seeing the world, right? And we're gonna talk about the, 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 this way of seeing the world. And their way of seeing the world is what some eco-feminist scholars call a logic of domination, okay? Um, the logic of domination, which we had, if we had time, I could explain to you the relevant European history that led people to be thinking in that way when they got here. But we don't have time for that. So, so the logic of domination divides the world, first of all, into dualisms, into binary dualisms. Hmm? Uh, male, female, human, animal, nature, culture, oh no, culture, nature, There's more. Oh, 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 a big one is um, reason, emotion, mind, body. Yeah? Okay. And the logic of domination says, okay, that the whole world is, we can see, it always appears in these twos. And the twos are separate and they're opposite each other. They're separate and opposite. Now this is... Let us, let's just pause for a moment and uh, in awe of the bizarreness of this idea. How in the world could the male and female of a species, and we're not even going to, this is, doesn't even get into leaving out intersex people and that, that it's actually a continuum. How in the world could the male and, and female of a single species be opposite each other? <laughs> Uh, and of course, right, humans are animals, yes? Uh, nature, nature, we're social animals, right? You do know that, right? All right, um, and, and, and it's the nature of social animals to create cultures. So how could culture be something other than nature? Much less the opposite of it. Reason and emotion. 
I mean, I guess they didn't know that then, but you know, it all just goes on in your nervous system, right? And we've just, you know, we've had these sensations and we have these cognitions and, and these things that are going on in our brain. And, and, and so some of them we call feelings and some of them we call thoughts. And that's useful for us in some ways, but they're not actually distinct. If you look in your brain, if you look at a scan of a brain, it's not like you can pick out, here's the feelings and here's the thoughts. It's all going on at the same time, right? Have you ever had a, a thought when you weren't also having some feeling? Or vice versa? No, of course not. You might have been really, really numb to your feelings, but they were still there. Um, what else? Oh, mind and body. That's a beautiful one, right? That's why I always point out that our brains are in our bodies. Because, like, what else is your mind except a function of your body? Um, so, uh, uh, okay, so the logic of domination uh, bizarrely divides the world into these binary dualisms, which are, which, are, which are considered to be opposite each other. And then, that's bad enough. Now you've just totally wrecked your ability to see the world accurately much less see the relationships among things in the world, but that doesn't make it things worse. They say, oh, 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 and by the way, uh, 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 of these opposites, one is always better than the other. Male over female, a a human over animal, mind over body. You don't need me to list them all. Oh, reason over emotion and more. And the logic of domination assigns, it does make relationships. Most of the time the logic of domination is doing nothing other than destroying relationships. But the one way that it does make relationships is it then assigns relationships among the things, the ones that are on the upside and the ones that are on the downside. And so males are seen as more rational. Women and people of color are seen as closer to nature. Women are seen as more emotional. You get the picture, yes? And um, oh, and if you want to put down some group of people, just call them animal names. Um, and so this teaches us uh, a little bit about how the whole system is maintained. Because again, this is another way of, of thinking about intersectionality. Because essentially this is showing us where those joints are. Those connections. Uh, those assumptions. Uh, uh, between the different terms in the logic of domination. Uh, uh, those are the things that we need to, to try and pull apart. Because they're what's holding the whole system together. Does that make sense? Okay, and, 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 and we can see this. I don't have time, but you, know, you could do it as an exercise. Uh, you can see every element of the logic of domination in what the colonizers uh, did when they came here. Um, because, again, this is not abstract. Yes, these were the ideas that they had in their heads. But those ideas then led to acts, right? To, to, to genocide, uh, to ecocide. And, and we see, we'll see that logic of domination. So we'll see, for example, that one of the things that uh, the, uh, the first, um, you know, the first few sets of, uh, of colonizers did uh, was, uh, was to take both people and animals back with them to be exhibited in what would now be called zoos. And actually this was already a pretty common um, behavior that imperialists engaged in, which was to show off uh, their conquests by means of putting um, non-human and human animals on display. Parading them through the streets, putting them behind bars in parks. We still have the zoos today, right? 
and and we have um uh for the most part human animal human beings are no longer being exhibited at least not in that way um but the zoo is still expressing the logic of domination. It's still expressing not only this idea that we could own animals, right? Because that's one of the key ideas that they brought over here. This idea that animal, non-human animals were not our, our, our kin, but were objects. Objects to, to, be, to, be, to be owned, uh, to be bought and sold, to be cut up into bits and pieces. This is the same way that they saw land, yes? Objects to be bought and sold. How bizarre, right? It's like owning a cloud or something. Um, oh, I, 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 so about the zoos, I just wanna make sure you're clear. So it's not, just, it's not just this idea that the animals in the zoo can be rightfully uh, held captive, put on display, and maybe you've fallen for this idea that, oh, we're saving them. Yeah, because we took their habitat. But, 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 but think about what the zoo is telling people. It's not just telling them you're superior to non-human animals. It's not just encouraging them to get a kind of, I'm sorry, we've got to say sadistic pleasure out of looking at beings behind bars. And you ever go, you'll hear all the kids are crying and their parents are telling them, no, no, this is happy. <laughs> and so then the kids have to act like it's happy and then pretty soon it does feel happy to them. Ugh. Um, uh, but the zoo is also telling you, we're so powerful. We can create an Africans of Savannah in Ontario. We can create an Arctic ice pond in Florida. That's how powerful human beings are. And when you, as a human being, go to that zoo, you're being propped up. You're being told you're over, over everybody, over land. OK, so but back to the land being chopped up. This actually brings us to the other thing I'm supposed to talk about, which is right. So, as you probably know, and we don't like to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hoping, you know, it's really important not to make the mistake of thinking that the um, literally hundreds of different um, uh, native uh, nations were identical. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 but as often the, as is often the case in regions, uh, you know, there are, there are, there are, there are often some, some commonalities. You know, for example, um, in Europe at this point, most of the cultures are individualistic cultures. They're not identical to each other, but they're mostly individualistic cultures. Most Asian cultures tend to be collectivist cultures as opposed to individualistic cultures. They're still really different. Japanese culture is way different from Korean culture, but they're collectivist cultures, right? Okay. Uh, 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 uh. So indigenous American cultures, for the most part, were collectivist cultures, uh, and for the most part, did not, uh, and indeed, did not have this idea of of, of ownership of land. Um, and I, 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 we can't tell the whole sorry story here. I just want to tell you about. I just want to tell you about something that happened in the United States, which is related, and that's uh, something that was called the Dawes Act. Anybody heard of that? No? Anybody here from the United States? Oh, well, that helps explain it. Okay. So in the United States, uh, there came a point. This was after some treaties had been made and many, many treaties had been broken. And, and many, many uh, uh, indigenous peoples were living on um, reserves. Notice that same word, uh, or reservations. Um, in which uh, the land was held by the tribe or nation, whichever they would choose to say. Hmm? And then the U.S. passed something called the Dawes Act, and the Dawes Act mandated individual ownership. Mandated. 
that reservation lands be divided up among the reservation members and that the reservation members be given individual title to individual parcels of land. And it went as you would expect, and, 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 and folks resisted this, but it, it was done. And, and, and the results were what would be expected when you have uh, people who have been pushed not only off of what were their own lands, onto these barren, often not home lands, um, and are living in fairly desperate poverty. Not just fairly desperate, very desperate poverty. And that is that one by one by one, individuals started selling. And, you know, once one person sort of oh, makes themselves break with everything their culture has told them because they really feel like they need to do this to survive, then that makes it a little easier for the next one to do it, and the next one to do it, and the next one to do it. And the next thing you know, uh, native lands had been reduced uh, precipitously. Why do I mention this one? I mean, right, I could pick any of I'm literally 10,000 awful things that were done. Why am I picking this one to tell you about? Because people were dispossessed by giving them rights, rights they didn't want. And this brings us to the other subject of my talk, which was rights in quotes, because uh, I'm kind of critical of rights. Um, and, and so have a lot of people. Um, and I know that the animal rights movement uses this word really uncritically. Um, and so I just want to make sure that you're aware of some of the critiques that exist of rights. But on the other hand, I'm really intrigued by this idea, uh, human rights are animal rights, because I actually, the more that I think about it, think that if we start to think about human rights as animal rights, that might actually help to solve some of the problems with the concept rights. So in the time that I have left, let's talk a little bit about rights. If I had time, I would wander around this stage like Oprah, and I would ask you what rights are. And, and, and even though you've been using the word yourself, and you might even belong to an organization called the fill-in-the-blank rights group, you'd probably have a really hard time telling me what exactly you mean by rights. Mm, entitlements? Access, how people, how things I need to protect me from other people. So I want you to think critically about this, and I'm going to introduce you to some critiques of rights. And the first critique of rights is an, 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 an anarchist critique of rights. Um, uh, the Chicago um, anarcha feminists of 1971 put out a manifesto that said, and I quote, obviously the world cannot tolerate many more decades of rule by gangs of armed males calling themselves governments. And whoa, we didn't even know about climate change at that point. Weren't they right? So I just want to remind you, you know, uh, especially since I had to like show my passport at the border to get here, uh, that uh, the world didn't used to be cut up into things called countries. Um, and that if you look at a map where all the things called countries are demarcated, there's all these lines and those lines are called borders, yes? And I just would like to remind you, as an anarcho-feminist, that every one of those borders, with the exception of a couple, are policed by people with guns. They may not always show you the guns. The very nice Canadian border guard uh, who looked at my passport did not show me his gun, but I'm sure it was there. Um, uh, uh, and there are armies, yes? 
armies massed behind all of those borders, and in fact, those borders were, were all created, how? Through processes of warfare, yes? And so, and so, and so, and so, anarchism reminds us that states as they are currently constituted are always violent. They were created by processes of violence, they are maintained by processes of violence. And so, and that is also true by, for our systems of laws, for our systems of laws. And so if what you mean by rights is what many people mean by rights, which is legal rights, Maybe that's a little troubling because then you're talking about enforcement. Enforcement by who? How? Will we be sending people to prison? Will we be using guns to enforce animal rights? What exactly will, what, what are we talking about here? So, so that's a troubling, that's one troubling critique of rights. That, they, that, 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 oh, and, 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 and here in Canada, I know, and in the U.S. as well, if you look at the constitutions, what these laws are mostly about, there's a nod to human rights or civil rights or, or, or civil liberties, whatever you want to call them, but for the most part, laws are about property. Laws are about enforcing property rights. And so we're right back to chopping up the world, chopping up the land into bits and pieces to be bought and sold. And if you're like me, and if, or if, you've, if you're following me here, then you understand that chopping the world into bits and pieces to be bought and sold is an inherently problematic process that is deeply linked to the exploitation of animals. So how exactly we're going to solve the exploitation of animals by incorporating them into this particularly violent legal system is not clear to me. So it's just something to think about. There are two different feminist critiques of rights, uh, uh, one that came sort of out of first world feminism, another that came out of third world feminism. Out of first world feminism, they're just pointing out the, the um, not only Eurocentric, but androcentric uh, way of thinking about the world. The, the, the way that we think about rights within Western democracies is the social contract um, theory of rights. It basically says that, um, um, oh gosh, um, it's a terrible, terrible thing uh, to have to live in collectives with other people. Um, human beings are naturally individuals. And, and if we come into contact with one another, it's, it's just so awful, uh, that we need to protect ourselves, uh, from each other. Um, that's the social contract theory of rights. And I'm serious. You, I, 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 I'm belaboring the point a bit, but if you go back and read the philosophies that this comes from, they presume that humans are individuals, notwithstanding the fact that we're all born out of some other person's body. Um, <laughs> and are completely dependent on either that person or another one for quite a long time, uh, and that human beings have never lived as individuals. We're not orangs, okay, right, or orangutans. They, 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 the, the, the males at least do tend to go off and live by themselves. Um, uh, but we're not that kind of animal. We're, we're a social animal, and we always have been. Um, and the theory of rights is pretty much based on the opposite of that. Um, uh, the other, uh, oftentimes you'll see, you, 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 it's happened many times that, uh, when people are interested in, um, the liberation of women, uh, try to sort of help women elsewhere, uh, uh, by means of, um, you know, proposing some women's rights legislation. Uh, the women in question have not been particularly interested in that and have said instead, um, mm, we're kind of more interested in water right now and um, also land. Um, and sometimes this has been misread as like, oh, they don't want rights or they don't. Well, what it is is, what it is is they're pretty clear that like rights written on paper is not going to solve their problems. Um, uh, uh, and in fact, this is the case. Uh, 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 many, many countries in which uh, hunger is rampant right now, many countries in which children are starving while food rots in storage containers, such as India, have written into their constitution a right to food. 
So, so there's the more the sort of pragmatic uh, 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 critique that, 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 and all of us here, right? Uh, uh, someone, the person who spoke, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so bad about the names. Uh, when we were hearing about the triggers and, and how many of us have endured trauma, Sarah. Uh, so, 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 so all of us have the right not to be beaten by our partners. Has that stopped it? All of us have the right, all children have the right not to be uh, sexually violated. That hasn't stopped it. My gosh, slavery is illegal. Everywhere in the world for the first time in human history. We also have more people enslaved than at any other time in human history. So this suggests to me a practical critique of rights. Um, there's also a post-colonial critique of rights that has to do uh, uh, with, um, with uh, this, this idea of individual versus collective rights. Um, uh, I'm not so sure... Now we're getting into animal rights. I'm not sure sure that fish want individual rights. At least free living fish. I'm thinking they may be more interested in collective rights. What do you think? But our way of thinking about rights, our Eurocentric way of thinking about rights is all about the rights of the individual and it's to protect the individual from other individuals and to protect the individual from the collective. So these are just some critiques of, oh, oh my gosh, and then Right, the individual, oh, no, I'll just leave this one out. I'm fighting with myself in my head while all these people are staring at me, <laughs> trying to decide whether to say another critique or not. Um, oh, I'll just say that, you know, uh, 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 so when, Colum when they all came over here, uh, 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 then what started to happen was European ways of thinking, uh, categorizing the world, um, um, became dominant here in the United, here in what is the United States and Canada as well. Um, and these include uh, modern ways of thinking about species, which is actually a very problematic concept. Uh, ways of thinking um, about gender, uh, ways of thinking about sexual orientation, what we now call sexual orientation. Uh, it didn't used to be heterosexuality didn't used to exist. What? Yes, because people weren't, it wasn't a noun. You, there, there weren't like gay people and straight people. There were people and some of them did this and some of them did that, but they weren't identity, you see? But we, we uh, another aspect of the logic of domination is this tendency to turn processes into nouns. Uh, 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 think, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, part of globalization has brought the gay rights movement worldwide. There are many, many people uh, who might be called uh, LGBTQ, uh, any one of those or, or, all, or an admixture who are really happy about that and are really are using the word gay rights or using the word trans rights, et cetera. But there's a whole other set of people who um, uh, might be so designated but actually decline to call themselves L or B or T or Q. Um, uh, 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 specifically because in their own culture's way of thinking, which was maybe a three-gender system or a four-gender system or a five-gender system um, in which um, same-sex relations were really common but not called by a particular name, uh, they think that going back to that, that pre-colonial uh, indigenous way of thinking about what we call sexual orientation and what we call gender identity is better for them. Uh, so there's that, that's a really new critique of rights. Um, but I gotta move forward. Um, okay, so if we reconfigure this though, if we think about this, uh, uh, this, the title of the conference, right? Human rights are animal rights, right? Oh, that's so interesting because then what we do is we say, we, we remind me, we remind everybody of something that I'm always reminding animal rights activists of, which is that different animals want different things. If we put anim human rights as a kind of animal rights, then it's just one kind of animal rights. Then we have to know, right? We have to know. Like fish aren't interested in freedom of speech. Um, people are really interested in that one. 
or at least some people are really interested in that one. There's actually a wide variety of, of things that people are, are, uh, want or don't want as rights. Um, and so this would maybe go a long way to reminding us that different animals want different rights. It might also help us if we think about animal, and if then we start thinking about what, what, what rights animals might want, oh my gosh. Then we start to think about rights that we haven't even really thought about giving people. I'm pretty sure fish want freedom of movement. And I'm pretty sure we have not given ourselves that right, yeah? I had to show my board, my passport at that border. There's all kinds of problems at borders. So, huh, thinking of, 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 of human rights as a kind of animal rights might actually spark a whole bunch of creative thinking about what rights might be and who, what, which things we ought to go for. And the last thing I'll say about rights is simply that myself, Having thought about it for a really long time, um, I don't have rights as an aim of mine. Um, however, uh, in activism, we think about aims. That's what you're aiming for. And then there are goals. Those are like things you're going to get along the way. And then there are tactics. There are the things you do to try and get your goals. And you put your tactics together into strategies, huh? So I think I'm starting to think about rights as a tactic um, or maybe a goal something that we might sometimes want to pursue as a step along the way to our aims, a tool that we might sometimes want to use, but not our ultimate aim. That's just my way of thinking. Uh, uh, but moving forward today, thank you so much for letting me give the keynote. Um, I would like you for the rest of the day to put all of these ideas about rights uh, all this, uh, aside. Think about that another day. Um, I, I wanted to say what I really want you to keep in mind for the rest of the day today is intersectionality. Um, and I really want you to keep it in mind in a way that's grounded. Grounded in this question of how can you apply this in your own work. Um, also, I would like you to ask yourself, what if you were me? What if you were me and you had to give the closing remarks at this conference? All day today, think to yourself, what if I had to give the closing remarks at this conference? What would I say? Because I think that can, this, attending this conference can be part of your way of training yourself to think intersectionally. So what you would do if you were me is you'd be listening really closely, right? You'd be paying attention to everything that everybody says, and you'd be constantly, steadily, steadily saying, what are the common themes? What are the takeaways here? What am I going to walk away with? How does this, how does what sh this person's saying connect to what this person said? Uh, and this other thing that I know. You'd be constantly steady, 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 making connections as you're listening and also thinking, what's the takeaway? How am I take this home? So that's what I really hope you will do today. Thank you so much for listening to me and, uh, have a fabulous day. I'll see you at the end of the day.